Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Multituberculates are an extinct taxon of rodent-like Allotherian mammals that existed for approximately 166 million years, the longest fossil history of any mammal lineage. Originating during the early Jurassic and finding spectacular levels of success during the Mesozoic, even surviving the KPG extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous, they eventually declined from the late Paleocene onwards, disappearing at some point during the early Oligocene. Although, if the mysterious Gondwanotheres are members of this lineage, then multituberculates lasted into the Miocene in South America. More than 200 species are known, ranging from mouse-sized to beaver-sized. These species occupy the diversity of ecological niches, ranging from burrow-dwelling to squirrel-like arborealism to jaboa-like hoppers. Multituberculates are usually placed as crown mammals outside either of the two main groups of living mammals, theria, including placentals and marsupials, and monotremata, but are often placed closer to theria than to monotremes. The multituberculates had a cranial and dental anatomy superficially similar to rodents such as mice and rats, with cheek teeth separated from the chisel-like front incisors by a wide toothless gap. Each cheek tooth displayed many rows of small cusps, or tubercles, which gives the group their name, that operated against similar rows in the teeth of the upper jaw. Unlike rodents, which have ever-growing teeth, multituberculates underwent dental replacement patterns typical of most mammals, though in at least some species the lower incisors continued to erupt long after the root's closure. Multituberculates are notable for the presence of a massive fourth lower premolar, the plagiolacoid. This is a type of blade-like, most often serrated tooth present in various mammal groups, usually as a premolar. Among modern species, it is present chiefly in diprotodontian marsupials, such as possums, potteroos, and betongs. Multituberculates, however, probably own the most specialised of all the plagiolacoids, in early taxa, all lower premolars became these large saw-like teeth. However, in Chimolodonta, premolars 1 to 3 degenerated and became peg-like or disappeared altogether. Instead, only the fourth lower premolar remained, which increased greatly in size. While earlier multituberculates displayed a normal tooth replacement for the plagiolacoids, in Chimolodonts this tooth was not replaced, being the last tooth to erupt and remain throughout the animal's life. In some groups of Maltese, such as the Taniolaboids, this tooth type vanished to be converted into a flatter, molariform tooth. Multituberculates first appear in the fossil record during the Jurassic period, and then survived and even dominated for over 100 million years, longer than any other order of mammaliforms, including placental mammals. The earliest known example is probably Rugosodon, a rodent-like omnivore living 160 million years ago in what is now China. During the Cretaceous, the multituberculates radiated into a wide variety of morphotypes. Most species of multituberculata appear to have been wiped out during the KPG extinction event, but they seem to have been among the first to recover and re-diversify again. The peculiar shape of their last lower premolar is their most outstanding feature. These teeth were larger and more elongated than the other cheek teeth, and had an occlusive surface forming a serrated, slicing blade. Though it can be assumed that this was used for crushing seeds and nuts, it is believed that most small multituberculates also supplemented their diets with insects, worms and fruit. Tooth marks attributed to multituberculates are known on Champsosaurus fossils, indicating that at least some of these mammals were scavengers. Maltese can be split into two very broad groups, the earlier and more basal Plagiolacida and the more derived Chimolodonta. The former first appeared in the Lower Jurassic and were extremely common and widespread until their extinction during the early Cretaceous. There were a large number of families within this group, including the Allodontids, Eobatarids and the Pulchophatiidae, the majority of these animals, of which dozens of genera are known, were common elements of the faunal communities at the famous Late Jurassic Morrison Formation of North America. 
There, several species, including Zophia batar and Salodon, lived in the same ecosystem as the well-known dinosaurs Allosaurus and Diplodocus. As a rule, these were small rodent-like animals with highly pronounced plagiolocoid premolars, and appear to have been either generalistic omnivores or herbivores that fed on seeds and plant material. The Eobatarids were more exclusively herbivorous and were native to Europe and Asia, while the Paulchofatiids were very common in Jurassic Age deposits of Portugal and the United Kingdom. Indeed, these were among the youngest members of Plagiolocida, with early Cretaceous Sarniodon being one of the last members of this order. The other major multituberculate lineage, the Chimolodontans, were more diverse and essentially took over from their more basal relatives over the course of the Cretaceous. Like most Maltese, their fossils have overwhelmingly been recovered from Laurasia, with remains being very rare from the southern continent. Whether this is due to poor taxonomic sampling or preservation biases is not known, and, as mentioned before, the herbivorous Gondwanathis may be within this true multituberculate lineage, although this is still a matter of debate. The most basal grouping seems to be the Tilodontoids, of which three or four possible families are known. These were generally arboreal and squirrel-like mammals with broad omnivorous diets. This ecological niche enabled Tilodontoids to be a long-lasting lineage, ranging from the late Cretaceous to the early Oligocene. Of these, the Tilodontids were the best known, especially the genus Tilodus. This animal lived in North America during the Paleocene and was clearly very successful, as up to seven species are known. It was fairly large for a multituberculate and up to 50 centimetres long, roughly the same size as a grey squirrel. Like these modern rodents, Tilodus possessed a long tail and the structure of its feet and flexible ankles indicates great climbing ability. The enlarged lower premolar was massive and blade-like, suggesting an omnivorous diet of seeds, nuts and the occasional insect or bird egg. Another family within Tilodontoidea, the Neoplagiolids, were similarly adapted but tended to be smaller. These were the very last of the multituberculates on the northern continents, only dying out in the early Oligocene, and managed to successfully live alongside rodents for many millions of years. It was once thought that the group as a whole were outcompeted by rodents, and this may be true in certain cases. However, the survival of generalised forms such as the Neoplagiolid Ectipodus until the Oligocene in Western North America does question this somewhat. Speaking of extinctions, despite the fact that many Maltese were wiped out in the KPG extinction event, they were also among the mammal groups to recover the most quickly. In Europe, the native Cogionids were unusual in that they were predominantly insectivorous, which is quite rare for multituberculates. Representatives are known from the Upper Cretaceous and the Paleocene of Europe. Having started as island endemics on Hateg Island, modern Romania, where they are in fact the dominant mammal group, and diverged into rather unique ecological niches, they then expanded across Europe in the Paleocene, where they briefly became a major component of its mammal fauna before their extinction. Like some modern rodents and shrews, at least some of these mammals had red, iron-pigmented enamel. In Barbatodon, this distribution is more similar to that seen in shrews as opposed to the condition in rodents, and suggests insectivorous habits. This is a unique evolutionary route taken in isolation of their island environment almost entirely deprived of competing mammals, and inadvertently resulted in their survival across the KPG extinction event. During the Paleocene, Hateg Island connected to the rest of Europe, and so these multituberculates dispersed. Fossils are known in France, Spain and Belgium, beside Romania's Paleocene deposits at Gisu. For a brief period of time, these were among the most common mammals in Europe, but by the late Paleocene, the arrival of other multituberculate groups from North America brought about a quick decline, culminating in their extinction at the end of the Paleocene. Another unique European form, Bophius, lived in what is now Belgium during the Paleocene, although it was rather large and was unrelated to the Cogionids. Meanwhile, the Kimolamayids are mostly native to North America, 
with the well-known genus Chimolomys being a common omnivore about the size of a rat. In addition, a number of other families are known from poorly preserved remains, and not much can really be said about them. These include the microcosmodontids and the eucosmodontids, both represented only by teeth. Despite their poor state of preservation, both groups survived the KPG extinction event and lived until the early Eocene. Fortunately, other multituberculates are known from much more comprehensive fossils. The Jatochgatheroids are one of the casualties of the Chicxulub impact, as their remains are only known from the late Cretaceous of Asia. The group was diverse in terms of lifestyle and body plan, with some genera such as Cryptobatar and Catopsbatar being Jaboa-like hopping omnivores. The latter in particular is a well-known animal that lived during the Campanian stage of the late Cretaceous of Mongolia. Unusually for a multituberculate, it is known from a near-complete specimen that gives us a good idea of its life appearance. This genus would have been a desert dweller, with a proportionately large skull, eyes placed far back on the head, and robust blade-like incisors. Well-preserved fossil remains of the genus Catops batar demonstrate that it possessed tarsal spurs like those of the modern platypus and other Mesozoic mammals. This feature was likely used as a form of defence against predators or in intraspecific competition. Unlike other mammals, the pelvis of multituberculates was very narrow. In other genera where the pelvis is known, each half of the pubis and ischium were fused together, forming a keel. The length and rigidity of the keel indicate that the pelvis could not spread widely during birth. Because there would be little space for the passage of an egg, it has been suggested that Catops batar and other multituberculates gave birth to tiny, poorly developed, fetus-like offspring similar to modern marsupials. When threatened by a predator, such as the contemporary Velociraptor, Catops batar would have hopped away like a jaboa or jumping mouse. Other multis would not have had this luxury, the Taniolaboids were a group of thick-set, herbivorous and fossorial animals that would have superficially resembled beavers, guinea pigs or marmots. They were among the largest members of Multituberculata, as well as the largest non-Therian mammals of all time. Average members of Taniolaboidia were about beaver-sized, and the largest even reached sizes comparable to the largest beavers ever known, like Castoroides with weights of about 100 kilograms. Aside from several basal genera, Taniolaboids can be divided into two main lineages, the Asian Lambdopsalids and the North American Taniolabids. The latter include the famous Taniolabis, renowned for its massive size. Unlike the longer-living Lambdopsalids, Taniolabids remained exclusive to the Paleocene of North America and did not spread into Asia nor did they develop the more sophisticated dental specialisations to cope with grasses. They were, however, large herbivores, being among the very first mammals to attain large sizes after the end of the Cretaceous. Indeed, this culminated with Taniolabis setting the record for being the largest multituberculate ever known. Lambdop salads probably evolved from a single radiation of Taniolaboids that spread into Asia from North America in the mid-Paleocene or earlier. Though they didn't become as large as Taniolabids, Lambdopsalids were still large by multituberculate standards, the largest species weighing around 30 kilograms. They are notable for their unique dental specialisations such as Hypsodonty, which seem to imply specialisations towards grazing. Lambdopsalids are notable for offering direct evidence of hair and enamel and tooth prism patterns among multituberculates. Hair and fur fossilise very infrequently, if at all. These mammals provide some of the earliest unequivocal examples of mammal fur. The Lower Cretaceous fossils of Eomaya, Volaticotherium and Castoracauda, with the fur still attached, are currently the oldest. Indirect evidence suggests that hair first appeared on non-mammalian therapsids back in the Triassic or even earlier. Lambdop salads lived in the final stages of the Paleocene, disappearing around the time of the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. They coexisted with a wide variety of rodent species. In fact, rodents are thought to have first evolved and diversified in Asia, indicating that there wasn't too much in the way of competition between both groups, 
having coexisted together for millions of years. The adaptations for the chewing of grasses in Lamdop salads mirrors that seen in Gondwana theers. Although, due to controversy over their phylogenetic placement, I will not be covering them in this video. Despite their incredible success, after at least 88 million years of dominance over most mammalian faunal assemblies, multichiberculates reached the peak of their diversity in the early Paleocene, before gradually declining across the final stages of the Epoch and the Eocene, finally disappearing in the early Oligocene, or mid-Miocene if Gondwana theers are actually multichiberculates. Traditionally, the extinction of these animals has been linked to the rise of rodents, and to a lesser degree, earlier placental competitors like Hypsodontids and Plesiodapiforms which supposedly competitively excluded multituberculates from most mammalian faunas. However, the idea that the Maltese were replaced by rodents and other placentals has been criticised by several paleontologists. For one thing, it relies on the assumption that these mammals were inferior to the more derived placentals, and ignores the fact that rodents and multituberculates had coexisted for at least 15 million years. According to some researchers, Multituberculate decline is shaped by sharp extinction events, most notably after the Tiffanium, where a sudden drop in diversity occurs. Finally, the youngest known multituberculates do not exemplify patterns of competitive exclusion. The Oligocene Ectipodus is a rather generalistic species, rather than a specialist. This combination of factors suggests that, rather than gradually declining due to pressure from rodents and similar placentals, Multituberculates simply could not cope with climatic and vegetation changes, as well as the rise of new predatory eutherians such as meacids. More recent studies show a mixed effect. Multituberculate faunas in North America and Europe do indeed decline in correlation to the introduction of rodents in these areas. However, Asian multituberculate faunas coexisted with rodents with minimal extinction events implying that competition was not the main cause for the extinction of the Asian species. As a whole, it seems that Asian Maltese, unlike North American and European species, simply never recovered from the KPG extinction event, which allowed the evolution and propagation of rodents in the first place. Sadly, the last species of Ectipodus vanished during the early Oligocene, putting an end to this extraordinary radiation of mammals. Multituberculates were remarkable in that they pioneered a lifestyle later exploited by rodents, and were so well adapted to this role that they became the longest lived of all mammalian orders. Ranging from the size of a small mouse to a giant panda, the Maltese stand out as one of evolution's greatest success stories, and they truly were the rodents of the Mesozoic. Thanks for watching everyone. Next week I'll be covering more speculative evolution content. So I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.